Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together again on the 18th of November, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar, which happens to be the seventh of the ninth month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it, according to what's written within the scriptures, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and all those related texts. But before we continue with our regular reading, and we're currently covering Bereshit or Genesis, I believe we're on 27 next. We were just talking about some information, and I had mentioned to the people in our fellowship together about chapter 29 of the book of Acts. So we went and found it real quick, and this is a website right here, Jeffrey of Monmouth, or Monmouth, right? Monmouth is it's pronounced by my friend in uh, the place where they live by, where you have the Isles of Avalon, Glastonbury right website and there's more on this in a minute but it has information about the book there's also another pdf that will i'll have both linked in the description for the video if anyone wants to look at them and you're more than welcome you can just put acts chapter 29 in the internet search and i'm sure you'll find at least a dozen references to it but this is a missing chapter from the book of acts and it helps to shed more light or to elucidate if you will the last parts of the missions of shaul before he was a martyr and also gives a little more detail about some of the peoples that he was encountering because if you remember and i'm sure it might mention in the text here he was commissioned to go and give the good news not only to the gentiles but also to the house of yisrael or the lost tribes in addition if you will which he does actually accomplish. If you've been following along, then you know that the Greek-speaking peoples, the Latin or Roman peoples, they're a mix of the sons of Japheth and Hebrews, those that were in the isles of the Mediterranean, Crete, Sicily, Sardinia, Spain, or what they called the Iberian Peninsula, where we have Gaul, which was France today, all of those were inhabited by paganized Hebrews, including the British Isles, by the time our Mashiach came. They were not the only indigenous peoples, but they were a predominant part of them. If you recall, Madai did not want the allotment that was given to him, and he begged to stay with his father-in-law, and he was taken over into the Middle East, where they became the Persian and Madai, the Persian Medes and Persians, right? The Medes are the, the children of Madai. The land in, allotted to him, if you look in Genesis, and I think it's in Yobelim as well, he was actually given what we call Spain, but he didn't want it. And that's actually a, what we call Tarshish in the scripture. And it was uh, Celto Iberian for a very long time. The Celts and the Iber the Iberian Punics, if you will, from Carthage, are all Hebrews in various states of paganism or heathenism, if you will. But back on track here, there's a lot of different history behind that. The ancient history of Caledonia, the Welsh um, records of the ancient kings of Britain, which starts with Brutus, the first founder of New Troy, which became London, who was a patricide in Italy, accidentally. He was foretold to happen, but he killed his father and he was kicked out. And then he freed Trojan slaves and he brought them over and founded the Britain people, right? But there's a lot of information that you can find on there. However, we're just going to cover what this has to say specifically about chapter 29 of the book of Acts, and then some history in regards to some of the people that were contemporary with them. During the first wave of persecution, you can find in books like The Coming of the Saints and Paul, St. Paul in Britain, are two books written that cover kind of the information here. But Yahusuf of Arimathea, Miriam, the mother of Yahushua, or Mashiach, Eleazar, or who we call Lazarus, and others were persecuted, taken, cast into the Mediterranean Sea in a ship without oars or sails, 
and they eventually were stranded and landed in southern France or Marseille. And from there, as you see, it says that Joseph of Arimathea made it his way to Britain. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and just read this, and I'll let them do the talking. So this is the missing chapter 29 of the Acts of the Apostles. We have seen in our investigation the persistent rumors of Yahusuf or Joseph of Arimathea in Britain, which again, it's recorded that he was there by 37 AD and already giving them the good news. The Caledonians, in contrast, the ones that were in what we call Scotland today, they did not get the good news until um, well after he came. They were walking in righteousness and keeping the laws of the altar. But after the sign of his advent came, where the foretelling happened to them, but they didn't see the signs of it anywhere, they started turning away from the word and they kind of went apostate. And then the Romans came in to northern Britain or to Scotland there before it was called Scotland and was able to do um, a lot of pillaging, took some as slaves and prisoners. And it was Caledonians that were actually running the siege engines that sacked Yerushalayim in 70 AD, just for the context and history there. But it was after the fall of Yerushalayim and a famine that happened in the land of of uh, Rome where the slaves were told don't come back just let them go to die somewhere else we don't want to have to deal with more mouths to feed and so they were released and they made their way back home with the good news and the survivors of the, the slaves there but right here it says we have seen in our investigation the persistent rumors of Yahusuf of Arimathea in Britain and how it is that we have been misdirected as to his burial place by the propaganda put out by Henry Blois. When we start to search into how it is that the Britons have a tradition of St. Paul or Kadoshi Shaul, right, coming to Britain and whether this is true. And there's, like I said, a book titled St. Paul in Britain about that entire topic. It seems an early apostolic tradition has been expunged just as the tradition of Yahusuf of Arimathea visiting Britain. These traditions, as Augustine found in Britain, were very much alive when he arrived, quote, who preferred their own traditions before all the churches in the world, or meaning before the apostate Nicolaitan Romans at the time. From a very early period, there could only be one culprit, the very empire which morphed into the self-professed inheritor of Mashiach, the corrupt Vatican Empire. The Roman Church, to maintain their monopoly, has been behind editing the sequence of events that transpired directly after the crucifixion. And we've already covered that before, but for anyone that wants to something to think about on this subject if you just regard that yahushua is the truth and he is the word made flesh so what happened to his body throughout his life is literally a microcosm of how men have regarded the truth throughout history and when he came to his own they rejected him they took him in the night abused and mistreated him delivered him over to the Romans who dressed him up in royal clothes, mocked him, maligned him, right? Made him unrecognizable as a man and then, and then killed him in a, well, in more or less a pagan sacrifice when you look into it, right? So all of that is reflected in what they did to the word. And when you, take that into consideration, it's easy to see that it was foretelling the very things that they did, that the, the word would be made unrecognizable from the truth that's retained in it is something that we can see today. And now that the, the words have been resurrected from the dead, literally in the land there with the, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
So back on track. It says, both Yahusuf of Arimathea and Kadoshi Shaul, or Joseph of Arimathea and St. Paul, came to Britain, but since the very beginning of the Roman Church's claim to primacy, wherever possible, any evidence of these visits has been purposely obscured because they want to hide who we are. They don't want people to realize if they're literally the seed of Abraham, then they literally are required to keep the promises and the words that are enjoined to his seed forever. One can understand how the tradition of Yahusa fell silent as the very core of the Nazarene religion was kept a secret by the Dumnumians, the inheritors of the portion of the Yahudim who reached Britain after the dysphoria. I've never heard of that. That was a wave of um, the Yahudim after they broke up and left the land. Some went to Spain and they became known as Sephardic Jews, if you will. And Jews is used because his name, he told us that he would take his name out of our mouth so that we wouldn't profane it among the nations wherever we were going when we were walking in error. He did it to the Yahudim and he did it to us. It's the truth, but he's given us his name again to know it for those who desire to. But either way, the Yahudim that went into Spain were known as Sephardic because Sephirat is Spain. Jews, right? The ones that went into Morocco were known as Moroccan Jews. The ones that went to Ashkenaz were known as Ashkenazi Jews. The ones, I mean, everywhere they went, they were called generally by the name where they were, were going. I can't say the same was true for those that went to Britain. Or generally, if they were migrating to other places, I, I don't know. But the three main branches are all named that way. And you can actually track where they went in history. People like to say Ashkenazi Yahudim are not real because they have the name Ashkenazi before them, but they're ignoring the history behind that. It's 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 really ignorant. It's kind of sad, but it, it people mock us for these things. It's just like the the put memes out that aren't true, but people share them because they look good, and it's really just mocking people that don't know better. This is the fact that the body of Mashiach lay on Berg Island was probably only known by royalty. The idea that our Mashiach was in Britain is a thing. There is actually someone that was named uh, named similar to him that had a wife they have records of, but our Mashiach was not buried there. It's a tragic error that some people believe. Okay, the, the word is pretty true on what happened. This is until the king under pressure from the Saxons bequeathed the island of to Glastonbury. If Melkin was the king whose name is illegible on the 601 charter, it would certainly explain how it is that he is cognizant of where Yahusa's body is. All right. And he's talking about things that we don't have detail in because he's been writing a history. He's talking about the stuff that he's been sharing here. So we, you'd have to uh, read. Rick, could I inter interject here? Yes. Uh, go back up there. Back up a little. It's uh, You read the uh, the fact that the body of Christ. Now, yeah. are we talking about Yahushua? That's what Play they say. On Berg Island? Yeah, that's what they say. Uh, well, if he's risen, there's no body. I, I know, brother. That's why I'm saying they, they have some beliefs and there's some things there that it, it's just not accurate. But these are facts that okay, they have. I, I got it. Yeah. This is what they actually They're saying have. it's fact. Yes, sir. They actually have history of a man who's named at the same as our Mashiach there, who had a wife. And they believe that um, our Mashiach had a wife and children, too. There's a whole thing about that. But it wasn't really him. That doesn't mean it didn't really happen. There wasn't a man named that. Okay. But we we have to be, we have to keep with the continuity of scripture. That others would come was foretold, right? We're told not to believe. When he returns, everybody's going to know it. And he does nothing in secret. 
Although he does appear to his taught ones secretly throughout the ages, we're not in that age right now. Oh, for anyone who doesn't know, because I just mentioned that, and I don't mean to do all these different segues, but the idea that there's only four good news accounts, I believe we've covered it. Irenaeus, or Irenaeus, the taught one of Polycarp, who, along with Ignatius, who was contemporary with Polycarp, they were both taught ones of Yahukanon, who was one of the emissaries that wrote the good news and the letters and revelation. So he wrote that there was only four good news accounts, and they happened to line up with the four manifestations of the coming of our Mashiach, the four winds of the Shamayim, the four living creatures that are before the throne of the Almighty, the faces of them. And it's explained like this, the face of the lion, which represents the book of Yahukanon and our Mashiach coming in his princely or in his authority and power. And that was when he was first revealed as, as Elohim at the beginning. He was a voice of Elohim walking in the garden. He appeared as Elohim to men in those times. And then the next one is the bull. That would be the face of uh, the, the first one would be the face of the lion, then the face of the bull which lines up with the book of Luke and the sacrificial role or the Kohen role of our Mashiach. And that was when he instituted the promises and covenant, the sacrificial instructions, and then Torah, right? And culminating in his being the sacrifice. Then you have the face of a man, the book of Matith Yahu, his coming as a man, which would be like the... Um, You'd start with the east wind, then you'd have the south wind, then this would be the west, if you will. And it lines up with, um, yeah, his coming as a man, Matith Yahu, and that's when he was walking in the flesh. And then he gave and poured out the Ruach, which is like the book of Mark and the face of the eagle, the outflowings of the Ruach and coming in foretelling, where he doesn't appear. It's like if we had known him in the flesh, now we know him no more like that. And this is the times where he's using his Ruach to influence things in the world because he's already came, he's already spoken, he's shown us everything he needs to. And he's waiting for us to get it right before he returns with the influences of his Ruach where he says, you know, prosperous is he who not seen yet still believes, right? That's where we're living right now. But... um. I mention all that because I don't believe that this is a time where he's going to manifest himself bodily to believers, period. Dreams and visions is how he says he speaks to foretellers. He appeared face to face to Moshe as a man does to his, to his own friend. And that was our Mashiach literally appearing and physically speaking to him. But that's not something that I think we're going to be experiencing at this venture, at this time in history, because it doesn't follow along with the pattern there. All right, so it says, so why did Kadoshi Shaul so wish to visit Spain and the British Isles? We should look at a little known and often dismissed document that has much in common, sorry, with our investigation. The document is now understood to be chapter 29 of the original Acts of the Apostles, and was translated by C.S. Sonai or Sonini from an original Greek manuscript found in the archives at Constantinople and presented to him by which would have been known as Istanbul, right? And presented to him by the Sultan Abdul Ahmed while visiting Constantinople. It gives an account of trips undertaken by Kadoshi Shaul after his two years in forced residence in Rome in his own hired house. The, this lost chapter 29 of the Acts of the Apostles was found interleaved in a copy of the French naturalist Sony de Manocourt's Voyage in Greece et in Turkey. 
uh, so the voyage of a Greek in Turkey, right? It was purchased at the sale of the library or uh, voyages in Greece and in Turkey. Possibly that's what it reads. I'm not, I'm not very familiar with that. So please forgive me. It says it was purchased at the sale of the library and effects of the late right honorable Sir John Newport barrister, right? MP. which I believe is part of the Parliament for Britain from 1756 to 1843. So this gentleman would have been alive and part of the Parliament during the uh, the renunciation of slavery for Britain. That's nice. This is uh, in Ireland, okay, whose family arms were engraved on the cover of the book. It had been in their possession for more than 30 years with a copy of the royal decree, the fair man of the Sultan of Turkey, granting to C.S. Sonini permission to travel in all parts of the Ottoman dominions. So it was given to him, and he kept it in his own writing right here, and that's how they had gotten it. And it was in his possession in that book for more than 30 years before it was, you know, he'd passed on along with the document from the, the sultan to give it legitimacy, right? No trace of the original Greek manuscript has been found to date, and for this reason, the document is considered a fake. Also, when you consider what it actually says and the other supplementary information, especially all the things I've been mentioning about the linguistics, the other history, the archaeology, and all the things that prove that there's Hebrews in Britain, it goes right along with what happened. It, it fits perfectly, and it makes sense why it was his, why it was hidden. Sorry about that. This is also the document appeared at the time when supposedly a new theory was in vogue that the Britons were part of the lost tribes of Yisrael when the Meloha Goim were coming in. Right? Few have considered that if a Frenchman. And by the way, it was never new. I don't mean to keep cut, cutting off, but a lot of people, they don't know this. It was not a new thing to believe that the Celtic peoples and the Germanic peoples were the lost tribes. It was something that's literally touted throughout history. You can find records all the way from the 13th, the 14th, the 12th century, where you had men making mention of these things here and there. But it was not until... The, the Meloha Goim came in, the, the birthright covenant Baraka to Ephraim with the fullness of the nations where the veil was being lifted. And then they were really coming to know that that was true. And that started with, um, I believe his name was Joseph Williams in England. And he was a gentleman who was self-educated. He went, he was homeschooled, self-educated, and he became a prolific lecturer about the lost tribes and he there's a very good book about all his speeches that he went out and did and he was talking about the archaeology the linguistics the ethnology and a lot of different things to show that all germanic speaking peoples were from the northern kingdom in dispersion that was the uh the beginnings of it in the 1700s and then it just got on more steam into the 1800s um leading up into the early turn of the, the 19th century there, where you had Charles Totten writing dozens of books on the topic about Menashe in America, the symbols of our heritage, the romance of history with the daughter of Zadik Yahu, Tay Taffy, being taken by Yeremi Yahu or Jeremiah from Egypt to Ireland, and then the founding of the kingdom of Ulster and how the, the seed of Dawid was perpetrated or perpetuated through that line there so there is a lot of books on it a lot of history and then the world wars calamity killing off lots of people chaos and atheism prevalent they just have been hiding the history since then this is few have considered that if a frenchman had been handed the original he would most certainly have handed it to a catholic authority for verification 
and it would have been originally translated and lost, just like the ancient history of Caldonia, with the preface in there mentions that he couldn't find anyone to translate it. A Catholic priest decided to, and the original was destroyed in the making of the work. It says the original would never have hurt, would never be heard of again if it glorified holy links to Britain or set apart links to Britain. The title page of Shannoni's work, in which the English translation of the document was found, has this written upon it. Travels in Turkey and Greece undertaken by order of Louis the Four or the Sixteenth, rather, and with the authority of the Ottoman court by C.S. Sinoni, member of several scientific or literary societies of the Society of Agriculture of Paris and of the observers of men, mors motorum vidit et ubis. Ubs, sorry. Honorary London printed for T.N. Longman and O. Rees. What's that? Peternoster Row 1801, unquote. The text first came to light in London in 1871 when it was printed in, as a six-page pamphlet by G.O.J. Stevenson entitled The Long Lost Chapter of the Acts of the Apostles containing an account of the Apostle Paul's journey into Spain and Britain and other interesting events. Should we look upon this chapter 29 document as being eradicated? from all extant copies of the Acts of the Apostles by the Roman religion at a very early date, specifically to nullify any notion that British might have, or that Britain might have a testing, or might have of testing primacy over Rome. That was part of it. They wanted to hide anything that would not show their th supposed authority to be supreme, right, with the invasion of the Nicolaitans there. If you want the most in-depth information on that, I can't recommend enough studying, not just watching, but studying the Antichrist for Dummies series on the YouTube channel, christmasisalie.com. They don't have everything accurate, but they, they absolutely show how Revelation shows what happens in the stars and the corresponding events in history. The other things, I mean, test everything, test that, and you'll be able to see it for yourself. It says the manuscripts from the Western text type as represented by the Codex Beze and the Alexandrian text type as represented by the Codex Synacticus, or Synacticus right? And it's this version right here that you can use online to see the placeholders prevalent throughout the text it's not the only one that uses them but it's one that we have available that you can study it says are the earliest surviving texts of acts the version of acts preserved in the western manuscripts contains about 10 percent more content than the alexandrian version of acts why should some unadulterated version not exist in constantinople far from the desire of those ready to rewrite history and who were bent on establishing their own monopoly by extension of the Roman Empire. It also may be, or it also may have been, the long hand of Rome trying to eradicate Father's Tove testimony concerning Montague, as we discussed earlier. The finding of Yahusuf of Arimathea would confirm the primacy of the British Assembly. Kahal is assembly or congregation. We don't want to use the, the circus there or church, which is the etymology is the same as the circus. The origin of that is the patron false female mighty one of Rome, who's known for, she's the founder of the circus, but she's known for spellbinding men and turning them into pigs through enchantments. I mean, not something we want to be involved with. It says, even though the, the father's Tove had initially deposited his information in the English college in Rome, had it not been for the existence of Mayhew's Trophia remaining unadulterated in Stillingfleet's private collection, perhaps knowledge of Melkin's marker point 
on the 104 mile line would have been lost. So again, he's he's mentioning things that we're not intimately familiar with because he's narrating his history here. But he's giving evidence that our creator, through means of here a little, there a little, has left things in history for us to be able to know the truth. We can infer, we can see there's bits here, bits there, where just like in his word, you have the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, you have the Book of Hanok, Yob Elim, the Common Scriptures, the Apostolic Constitutions, what was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. When you look in all of these, you find the fullness of his heart's intent revealed. And it's a little here, a little there, a piece there, a piece here. And it's not until you see the, I mean, even now, you can read it a dozen times and still not get the full picture. But the more you do, the more you see, no man can fake that. No man can just make it up and, and have these things through different means, through thousands of years of time, carried down in history in a variety of ways to be available to us today to know without it being from above. It's just not possible. So it said, certainly without this reference point on a line, there would be less chance of verifying one has found the true location of in Whitrin. I cannot pronounce the, the uh, Welsh pronunciations for things correctly. I don't know how they do that. So please forgive me. Perhaps by chance, this extent copy of chapter 29 has survived, preserved far away from the hands of Rome. The papacy has perverted the truth about events after the crucifixion and eradicated evidence of Kadoshi Shaul's visit to Britain. An argument put forward for Shaul's visit to Britain can be found in a book first published in 1861, subtitled The Origin of British as Opposed to Papal Christianity, by the Reverend R.W. Morgan, better known as St. Paul in Britain, which... I just mentioned that to you. However, as to the ingeniousness of Sinoni's work and, or sorry, as to the genuineness of Sinoni's work and the fact that he did witness chapter 29 in Turkey, seems beyond a doubt when one considers he was traveling during the reigns of Louis XVI, who reigned from 1774 to 1793 and would have published during this period or soon thereafter. Why, one must ask, would a Frenchman fabricate or bear witness to a manuscript which confers on Britain a visit of Kadoshi Shaul? This could have been understandable as a work of polemic written by the British, meaning the British and the French were at odds right now. 1774 to 1793, that's during the revolution. And if you recall, Britain was fighting against America and France was, was in league with us. They were helping. So Britain and France were not, not necessarily on the same team right now. They would have had political and other means of not being, uh, not being congenial or wanting to do things that would be legitimizing that other side whatsoever. And he said, and he would have published it sooner thereafter. Why, one must ask, would a Frenchman fabricator bear witness to a manuscript which confers on Britain a visit of Kadoshi Shaul? This could have been understandable as a work of polemic written by the British, but a work possibly faked by a Frenchman tends to confirm its validity. In the second letter of Kadoshi Shaul to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.21, St. Paul, or Kadoshi Shaul, sends to Timothy the greetings of Ebulius Pudens, right, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. Claudia, the only woman to be mentioned, is said by tradition to be the wife of Pudens, and that she was the mother or sister or aunt it was either the mother, I never heard mother actually, it was the sister or the aunt, like a, a motherly type figure to him, excuse me. But I think that she was his older sister and her name was originally Gladys or Gladys. But when she was taken to Rome, the 
they named her Claudia. But she was to be the wife of Putin's and that she was the mother or sister of Linus, who was the second overseer of Rome. All right, he was the first. And Kadoshi Kepha's successor after his death. Now, that's where they have perverted history. Kepha was never the overseer of Rome. He was a martyr there around the same time that Shaul was. Before then, Linus was made an overseer. After him, there, there might have been one more. But at the martyrdom of Kepha, Clement was made overseer in the 60s, and he was the overseer there until the 90s when he was killed by Domitian. So th this is known history. Th that is a lie, or that is inaccurate. But um, we'll just continue here. For the successions of the overseers, too, there is, a, there is a section in the Apostolic Constitutions that talks about those that were made overseers during the lives of the emissaries, and it gives a list of all of them. Linus is included, Ebulius, or um, the first overseer of Antioch, and then after him, Ignatius, the one who wrote the, the epistles of Ignatius while he was being taken from Antioch to Rome to be fed to the lions as a martyr or wild beasts, right? But let's continue. It says, some have assumed that Claudia Rufina is the same Claudia being greeted and who was married to Alias Putin's a senator and friend of Marshall, the poet. She was definitely British, right? She was the daughter of Karadok, right? So was Linus. Karadok was the pen dragon or the head king of the, the... They all had different kingdoms of the Welsh that were there, the Britons, if you will. And he was the king of kings, the pen dragon, or the leader of leaders that was leading the war efforts against Rome. He was betrayed and captured and taken to Rome along with his two children here. Linus was made an overseer and Claudia married in to uh, the nobility or the uh, aristocracy of Rome, as you can see. So continuing. It says, she was definitely British and described by Marshall as, quote, sprung from the woad-stained Britons. W woad, right, is... Um, I will worry about that later. It says, it is not sure if she was the daughter of an exiled British king living in Rome, she was, like I said, Cardoc. There's actually, in 1917, they had the official genealogy, the official genealogical records of the monarchs of Europe and specifically of the Windsor dynasty of England um, fully established. And it traces all the way back to Adam or Yahuda and then from Yahuda to Dawid through most of the monarchies of throughout time all the way down to her right the former queen elizabeth that is but in there it has caradoc right there and claudia and linus is his children for whatever that's worth for you and that's freely available at the artisanspublishers.com it has a lot of books on the topic from a, ge a gentleman named E. Raymond Cap, some translations of the Dead Sea Scrolls, his book, uh, All the Coming of the Saints, St. Paul in Britain, and his book, The Missing Links Found in the Assyrian Tablets, also the names of the Israel in captivity, uh, what I had mentioned earlier. All of those are available at that art artisanpublishers.com at least they were last time I checked if you're interested in getting them yourself and it mentions him right here Caradoc is Caracatus okay so it says Tiberius or yeah Tiberius Caesar Cogdibudinus who ruled as a Roman client in the late first century or the daughter of the British resistance leader Caracatus which is Caradoc right who gave the famous speech in the senate which preserved his life normally they parade the leaders of enemies around the show them off and then kill him but he gave a speech and they allowed him to live he eventually returned back to the land and his father who was a druid bran 
was already a believer and he became a believer afterwards. It says, if this is the same Claudia as the friend of Kadoshi Shaul, which it is, Claudia and Putin's were also the hosts of Kadoshi Kepha and their house, which became the assembly of Kadoshi Pudintinia in Rome. It, it was literally the, uh, the the palace of the Britons that became an over uh, a house of worship there. After Linus, that was taken over, that particular building was taken over by Hermas, who wrote The Shepherd of Hermas and was a contemporary of Clement, who was also an overseer at Rome. And it was the place where Kadoshi Kepha celebrated. That never happened. So we're just skip it. Now, it, the first assembly in Rome was established by Britons. That is true. But they never celebrated the uh, mass there. They're talking about breaking bread and keeping communion, which is a little different. The Roman church founded on St. Peter had been entrenched or entertained by offspring from a royal king that had already accepted the truth of Yahushua as Hamashiach or the Messiah. Such readiness to receive the truth could have been established by the presence of Yahushua of Arimathea in Britain straight after the impalement or crucifixion. It is this presence of Britons in Rome and persistent rumors of the Kodesh family settling in Britain which at a later time was has caused, and the reason why that is, just so you know, because Constantine was also British. Helena, his his mother, was from Britain, and he became the Caesar there. He was, uh, as the good news was brought in by Hebrews from Britain, the same thing as the paganism, the mixture of the sun worship. He was the one that sanctioned the uh, keeping of the Sunday, the councils that established that, um, he crowned Sylvester, literally the wild beast, in the second rendition of the white horse rider as seen in the stars, right? When he when that happened was, I believe, within the month of when he gave the the crown, the triple crown to Sylvester, where he could be the temporal and religious leader over in the Western Empire. And he was taking over, well, the temporal, or religious, not not uh, temporal, sorry. It still had an emperor for a while, but he gave the crown to Sylvester, and Sylvester went over to head the Nicolaitans in Rome when Constantine went over to the eastern part of the empire and founded Constantinople at that time. So, so it is the presence of Britons in Rome and persistent rumors of the set-apart family in Britain. So anyways, like I was saying, they brought relics. They brought pieces of wood they thought was his cross. They thought the, the Holy Grail. And they had other idolatrous things they were setting up at, contemporary with him in that area. Because tragically, he was raised to believe in um, sun worship theology. You can see that in the writings. He was taught by a gentleman named Lactanus or Lactanius. And in the anti-Nicene father's writings, or the writings they say from the first 300 years of believers, they actually have some that are a little bit after, and they include the letters or the writings of Lactinius when he was teaching Constantine as a boy. And this part I learned about from the Antichrist from Dummies videos as well. But in there, he has a teaching on the Epsilon and the, the broad path and the narrow way and how they taught him how that pointed to sun worship illusions contrary to how it was taught by our Mashiach. It's literally written. You can see it right there where he was taught about those things. So it's not a surprise that he was a sun worshiper or mixing pagan beliefs because that's literally how he was trained from a boy. And I can't say that he might have done that intentionally or with nefarious intent, but it is, recorded history they are different it is true and you can look at these things for yourself all right it says, it says especially when these pretensions became a point of contention between bishops partly later due to a struggle to establish creeds and dogma and also due to the contention of events prov provided by british sources as to what transpired after the crucifixion 
300 years after these contentions, John Chrysostom, which literally means golden mouth, he was contemporary with Sixtus III. If you remember, Sixtus came to power in four or in, yeah, it was 340 AD. He had just finished compiling what became known as the Theodosian Codex or the beginnings of Roman canon law as we know it today, which is also known as municipal law or municipal code, literally the man-made code and statutes that are governing all peoples today that they try to make men subject to instead of his word. Sixtus the third, the 666 foretold the revelation 340 is when he was crowned as overseer and he died or sorry, 342. And he died eight years later as a representation of the little horn being during this eight day time where you have the 7,000 years, then you have um, Satan being imprisoned for the millennial reign and then released for a time. After that release, he's going to gather who he will, and then they're going to come against the real believers. And that's when fire will come down and consume everything that isn't of, of our maker. And then he'll have the general resurrection, the great white throne judgment, the new creation in our forever after in, in Tov. But that represents the eighth day. Boom. That's when he was cut off. At least that's how I comprehended that but he's the one that instituted lent the abomination of desolation with the christ mast on december 25th the uh, the offering of the the pig right uh, with the offering to zeus in the temple of our creator foreshadowed in antiochus but typified in him spiritually it was all done with sixtus the third and then it says that he's given a mouth to speak great things and blasphemies in Revelation. That was foretelling this gentleman right here, Chrysostom, the golden mouth, who was really the um, main instigation for anti-Semitism throughout the world at that time. You, you just look at his sermons, and he was the cause of all the murders of Yahudim and persecutions for those that rejected our Mashiach and sincere believers. It was from his sermons that rallied up men into the mob mentality that would start the uh, mass persecutions that would wipe out the bodies of believers or literally um, be the murder, the martyrdom of his body in history. But it says he writes in his Contra Judacos, quote, even the British Isles have felt the power of the word for there too assemblies and altars have been erected there too as in the extreme east or in the south, men may be heard discussing points of scripture with different voices, but not with different belief. Unquote. All right. Um, it, it goes on. I don't want to get too far into that because there could be a lot more and I, I could talk a lot about it, but there's a whole bunch of history in this. I really, really recommend you read it on your own. Um, the Havita, this was the a group of Celtics that were all in a con confederated kingdom, if you will. The Belge, it, or they came to London from France. So there's a lot of history with the travels of these people, but they're all Hebrews. Everyone that was known as Celtic or Germanic is literally from the seed of Abraham. One went to the west first, one went to the east first, and the dialects changed accordingly over time. But let me just read through here and then we'll end for today because we kind of went really far. I'm sorry. This is Acts chapter 29, right? And uh, I'll leave, like I said, this will be in the description. You can read through that. I'd love to go over more of it, but we'll get in. So chapter 29, it says, and if you remember, he stayed in two years and he was having great success in witnessing in his own home where he was not being bound with chains while being held at Rome, okay? It says, in Shaul, full of the Barak, or Barak oath or blessings of Mashiach and abounding in the Ruach, departed out of Rome, determining to go into Spain, for he had a long time purposed to journey thitherward and was minded also to go from thence into Britain, 
For he had heard in Phoenicia, that's what the Greeks called all of what we they call Palestine today, including the land of Israel or Yahuda. It was known, the whole Levant, as they call it, was Phoenicia. For he had heard in Phoenicia that certain of the children of Israel, about the time of the Assyrian captivity, the 721s BC, right, had escaped by sea to the isles afar off, to the north and west, the isles or the coastlands of the sea, it mentions, all right? And that is also witnessed by um, what we covered not too long ago. There is a king in 510 BC called Monmoth or Malmontus. And Malmontus had laws that he established that are literally the right rulings or the statutes from scripture he had founded and his laws were copied transferred into translated into latin and then copied from latin into english by alfred the great when he instituted his dooms and it's literally the 10 commandments and then the right rulings from chapter 21 to 23 of of scripture as the law what we what we call the common law that is the supreme law of the land in england and america even to this day uh, so there's another evidence for these facts. The people who had the Torah after the Assyrian captivity were in the British Isles actually with those laws in keeping them. And that's what we call the common law today. But moving on, it says, and he escaped to the Isles of Far Off as spoken by the foreteller and called by the Romans Britain. And Yahuwah commanded the good news to be preached far hence to the Gentiles and to the lost sheep of the house of Yisrael, the commission given to Shaul earlier in Acts. And no man hindered Shaul, for he testified boldly of Yahushua before the tribunes or tribunes and among the people. And he took with him certain of the brethren which abode with him at Rome. And they took shipping to Ostium. And having the winds fair, were brought safely into an haven of Spain. And much people were gathered together from the towns and villages and the hill country, for they had heard of the conversion of the apostle, or emissary, and the many miracles which he had wrought. And Shaul preached mightily in Spain, and great multitudes believed and were converted for they perceived he was an emissary sent from Elohim. And they departed out of Spain, and Shaul and his company, finding a ship in Amorica, sailed unto Britain. They went therein, and passing along the south coast, they reached a port called Raphinus. Now when it was noised abroad that the emissary had landed on their coast, great multitudes of the inhabitants met him, and they treated Shaul courteously, and he entered in at the east gate of their city, and lodged in the house of an Hebrew, and one of his own nation. Now it, this is this is not part of it, but they're saying where this port is is not clear, okay? It says, and on the morrow he came and stood upon Mount Lude, which is where we have London today. It was originally New Troy, all right? And the people thronged at the gate and assembled in the broad way. He preached Mashiach unto them, and many believed the word and the testimony of Yahushua. And that's exactly where Kadoshi's Cathedral stands today. It was burnt down in 1066 with the fires of London, the retaliation, the vengeance that our Creator took upon them for their burning of quote-unquote heretics, right? Also foretold in Revelation as the fire coming out of the mouth of the two, of the mouth, singular, of his two plural witnesses. They were mostly, his witnesses were burned in Constantinople and Rome, and then those two places had huge fires that destroyed them, and specifically went after the catholic churches that were there but it burned down at that time and then it was rebuilt with masonic symbolism afterwards at the same time that 
the business district of London was being rebuilt and made its own little city state. This is an at even at evening, right? The set apart Ruach fell upon Shaul and he foretold saying, behold, in the last days, the El of Shalom shall dwell in the cities. All right. Now, I, I didn't really get that before, but I'll help you. It's the cities that Babylon first made rules that were contrary to his instructions. The cities are where municipal code are enforced, right? It's the cities that the Jesuits had the Catholics flock to to, to hijack our country. And it's the cities where the Elohim of Shalom shall dwell in. And the inhabitants thereof shall be numbered, and in the seventh numbering of the people, their eyes shall be opened, and the esteem of their inheritance shine forth before them. And nations shall come up to worship on the mount that testifies to the patience and long suffering of a servant of Yahuwah. And in the latter days, New tidings of the Besora shall issue forth out of Yerushalayim, and the hearts of the people shall rejoice, and behold, fountains shall be opened, and there shall be no more plague. In those days there shall be wars and rumors of wars, and a king shall rise up, and his sword shall be for the healing of the nations. And his shalom making shall abide in his, the esteem of his kingdom, a wonder among princes. And it came to pass that certain of the Druids came unto Shaul privately and showed by their rites and ceremonies they were descended from the Yahudim, which escaped from bondage in the land of Egypt or Mitzrayim. And they were the, the keepers of the secrets, right? They were the sons of Louis that went pagan. They're the Kohanim and teachers that uh, Druid is the keeper of knowledge in Celtic. But they had kept the rights and the truth and it got perverted over time is what happened. It says, and the emissary believed these things and he gave them the kiss of Shalom. And Shaul stayed and lived there for three months. He was confirmed in the belief and preached Mashiach continually. And after these things, Shaul and his brethren departed from Raphinus and sailed unto Atium in Gaul, which is what we call France today. And Paul and Shaul or Paul preached, preached in the Roman garrisons and among the people, exhorting all men to repent and confess their sins. And there came to him certain of the Belgae, Celtic peoples to inquire of him of the new doctrine and of the man Yahushua and Shaul opened his heart unto them and told them all the thing or all things that had befallen him how be it that Mashiach Yahushua came into the world to deliver sinners and they departed pondering among themselves upon the things which they had heard and after much preaching and toil Shaul and his fellow laborers passed unto Helvetia that was, it's not a defined border area today, but you'd call that the lower parts of Germany, what they, they'd say, uh, the Danube around the Rhine. And then um, throughout Europe, it was a confederation, but it didn't have a set territory. And he came unto Mount Pontius Pilatus, where he who condemned Yahuwah Yahushua dashed himself down headlong and so miserably perished. After arriving in northern France, this is not part of the script, right? And traveling through Belgium and Helvetia, the writer seems to think he arrives at a place that Pontius Pilate found death in Switzerland. Eusebius, in his Historia Ecclesia number 2, verse 7, quotes some early apocryphal accounts for which he gives no source, which relate that Pilate met his misfortune in uh, Coiglia's reign. Uh, Coiglia, he was an emperor that was rather insane, right? And was exiled to Gaul and eventually committed suicide there in Vienna, where a monument called Pilate's Tomb can still be seen. All right, continuing, it says, And immediately a torrent gushed out of the mountain and washed his body broken in pieces into a lake. 
And Shaul stretched forth his hands upon the water and prayed unto Yahuwah, saying, Yahuwah Elohim, give a sign unto all nations that hear Pontius Pilate, which condemned thine only begotten son, plunge headlong into the pit. And while Shaul was yet speaking, behold, there came a great earthquake, and the face of the waters was changed, and the form of the lake like unto the son of Adam, hanging in the agony upon the stake. And a voice came out of Shemaim, saying, Even Pilate has escaped the wrath to come. For he washed his hands before the multitude at the bloodshedding of Yahuwah Yahushua. When therefore... Shaul and those that were with him saw the earthquake and heard the voice of the messenger. They esteemed Elohim and were mightily strengthened in Ruach. And they journeyed and came to Mount Julius. Remember, Julius was the son of Zerah of the Latinum peoples that became the leader. When Yeremiah, who was taking Taffy over to Ireland, they had landed by the boat. They landed in the area and captured a son of Julius of the tribe, of the Julian peoples. And he foretold to him about giving the dominance or dominion to the Roman empire during their watch through the night, which was uh, allowed by our maker. So very interesting foretelling about that in there, which is in what's called Te Taffy. It's a book that was made in the 1800s, but it was the compiled history of the events from the Irish bard songs that were put together. All right, it says, and it says, and they journeyed and came to Mount Julius, where stood two pillars, one on the right hand and one on the left hand, erected by Caesar Augustus. And it says, and Shaul, filled with the Kodesh Ruach, stood up between the two pillars, saying, men and brethren, these stones which you see this day shall testify of my journey hence. And verily I say they shall remain until the outpouring of the Ruach upon all nations. Neither shall the way be hindered throughout all generation. And they went forth and came into Elysium, or Lycrium, or Elysium, sorry, intending to go by Macedonia or Macedonia into Asia. And favor was found in all the assemblies. And they prospered and had shalom. Amen. The traditional way that Luke ends every one of his writings, which is missing from chapter 28. So, Ab willing, that will be edifying and uh, something that's beneficial for everyone. And uh, you can have something to chew on and maybe that'll help tie some things together. If you have anything that you'd like to share, please do so in the comments and you all have a wonderful Shabbat and rest of your week ahead. Shavuot Tov, and we will see you next time.